Research at the end of the Graduate School of Montana Tech. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Montana Tech's first um, lecture, public lecture of the academic year 2019-2020. Um, not only is this the first academic lecture of the year, but also it's a special one because it's the first public lecture we have sponsored by Montana's new NSF F-score statewide project, which is called CRUZ. That's very easy to remember. CRUZ stands for Consortium for Research and Environmental um, <laughs> Water Systems. <laughs> Environmental Water Systems. Um, and uh, we're very grateful to CRUZ for sponsoring today's talk. And I think every semester about we'll be having a CRUZ, a special CRUZ talk. Because this is a CRUZ lecture, it's my pleasure not to introduce today's speaker, but to introduce <laughs> Dr. Jerry Downey. Jerry is the Montana Tech Lead Principal Investigator for the Cruz. Well, thank you very much, Beth. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first Cruz lecturer, uh, Joe Griffin. And Joe and I spoke a little bit before on this presentation, and I learned that he earned his degree in geology from the University of Montana, but he's actually through uh, a great deal of personal training and experience, uh, an experienced hydrogeologist. Uh, Joe's had over 30 years of experience in evaluating the Upper Clark Fork River, Superfund site, and in particular the Butte and Anaconda area, highly knowledgeable on toxic mine waste and groundwater contamination issues. He served as a consultant to Atlantic Richfield, and then more recently as the state project officer for Butte Priority Soils at the Montana Department of Environmental Quality. So, and uh, as the flyer indicated, now that he's a serious hobby since his retirement was in 2016, is that? Yes, okay. 2015. 2015, okay. So, without any further ado, Joe Griffin and his topic of this presentation is Restoring Silverboat Creek After More Than 100 Years of Mining a Super Fun Story. Joe. Thanks, Jerry. Um, thanks for coming, folks. Um, I don't know how, I, I redo these talks all the time, so if I'm talking to somebody outside of Butte, I have to explain a lot more. So I'm assuming there's at least a basic understanding, a little bit of Butte geography, but probably get it all anyway. So this is a, a picture of Butte Reduction Works. This is kind of what it looked like when I first came to Butte in 1990, except that the stack wasn't there. Um, but that's all tailings, basically, along Silverbow Creek. Um, and we're going to explore this whole kind of history, and we're going to include the history of the environmental portion of this. And it starts probably earlier than most of you would think it had. So um, this is kind of the story arc, right? So if uh, zero represents a fairly dead stream, and 10 represents a pristine stream, then there's kind of our timeline. Uh, you'll notice that I have all of these points along the right axis. And um, so, first of all, we're going to look at what was Butte like? What do we know about Silverbow Creek before mining started, before a white man got here? Um, so what is pristine? And it comes to us from Salish uh, oral history. And they had a place name for Butte. And it was Sintapke, which meant the place where you shoot something in the head. And is what they were talking about. <laughs> I know. The something was bull trout and big bull trout in a little stream could be easily harvested with a bow and arrow. So we have some indication it was, it was always this richest hill, right? It had this huge ore body, and it was probably putting copper into the creek at a little higher rate than most other streams, but it was still pristine. So what about the far end, kind of where we're at now? And um, it did. It wasn't completely dead, actually. There were some organisms that live in it, but you know, there's uh, 
organisms that live in extreme temperatures and pH and all sorts of things. So, but it was pretty limited and it wasn't the kind of things, it wasn't the diversity that we would like in the stream. So the main way that under Superfund you say how well are we doing is we compare it to um, water quality standards and I'll get into that a little bit more. But in this case, there's a difference between the state standard and the federal standard. We'll talk about that a little bit, um, but EPA's decided that the state standard for the most part will be the standard we live with. Um, so here's that far end again, but this is, this is in Silverbow Creek and this is copper concentrations right at where Silverbow Creek leaves this valley. So it, right where it heads under the interstate. And we can see that same sort of asymptotic curve and it's curving down. And so let's look at that portion right there from 2006 to 2020 and see what it looks like. Well, it still looks like it's coming down a bit, right? There's still progress there. I mean, it looked flat before. But let's talk about this. What, let me go back here. Um, so that big spike down there in 2018, that's 20 parts per billion. What's 20 parts per billion mean to a cutthroat trout? That's where we want to start applying water quality standards. They're kind of an end all, they're kind of a one size fits all standard. It's based on testing a lot of organisms. But the standard is uh, based on the hardness in the stream when you take the sample and it's a logarithmic function, so it's kind of complex. Um, and there are actually two standards. One is the chronic standard, that's for a stream during normal flow conditions that includes high flow during spring runoff. But then we have what happens when we have a storm event, and they apply something called the acute standard when you have a storm event because it's short-lived. So the justification is um, they can withstand a higher concentration if it's only for a short period of time. So you can see um, at 100 hardness, the chronic standard is nine and uh, the acute standard is 14. <clears throat> so an easy way to reinterpret a graph like that is you simply take the water the water quality, you take the concentration, you divide it by the standard, and you come up with a ratio, which simply tells you if it's greater than one, you're out of compliance, and if it's less than one, that's good. It's meeting standards. So here we can see at SS07, the station that is at where Silverbow Creek leaves Butte, um, we're still missing it during normal flow conditions. This does not include storms, but we'll get to that. So now let's look at a little history of this whole beast. So this is, um, this is the Butte Reduction Works. Um, it doesn't have that same stack, but this was my first picture. And at this time, in the late 1800s, the practice for the smelters and mills in Butte was just to use um, Silver Bell Creek as a sewer. So all the tailings went right down into the creek. In this case, um, this is Silver Bell Creek in the middle, and then you have tailings and palmets on both sides, and you can see they have taken out some of the cribbing so that they can decant the water off the top. Um, this Hugh Magone versus Colorado smelting. We can thank Hugh Magone for coming to Butte in the day and taking a lot of pictures at that period. Um, but he was a rancher in the Deer Lodge Valley and his complaint was that they were using Silver Bow Creek to irrigate with or the Deer Lodge River, which is the Clark Fork, and that they were putting tailings on their, on their hay fields and it was killing their hay fields. The judge ruled in favor basically of Colorado smelting and refining and said, I'm not about to stand in the way of industrial progress. And he also said, you should have been a little smarter than put your farm downstream of this operation. Um, so in 1908, we had the flood of record across the state of Montana. 
Long story short, it washed everything uh, right on downstream. So most people think environmental control started sometime maybe in the 70s or the 80s. Not so. I think that flood made the Anaconda Company go, whoa, maybe this isn't a good thing because they put in the first of the Warm Springs ponds. So this is Silver Bow Creek. It goes through these ponds, comes out the other side, meets, meets uh, Warm Springs Creek and becomes the Clark Fork. But these first of the ponds was put there to trap tailings from going on down the Clark Fork. 1911. The opportunity tailings impoundment, same thing. Most people don't think that's an environmental control. It's way better than putting the tailings directly in the creek. And I'm not sure when they started exactly. But um, this is a graphic from the period 1932 to 47. These are the ponds. Here's a smelter on the hill. You can see that it starts here at the precipitation tanks at the mine. And it goes downstream, Silver Bow Creek, into the Warm Springs ponds, and then out. Um, and then there's all these other flows. Actually, they were taking water out of Silver Bow Creek to put on the tailings to make sure they stayed wet and didn't create a dust problem. But look at the places where they were paying attention to the pH or controlling pH with lime. And, and I'll point out here, pH of 11, that's coming, that's decant water. Um, and, and it's the same today. If you went up and measured the pH of the tailings in the Yankee Doodle tailings impoundment, they're 11. It's part of the, it's been a long part of the process. Um, but leaving and going into the Clark Fork, they say it was seven. Um, so moving on into the 70s, um, I just, I love this saying, <laughs> and it, and it kind of keeps getting reiterated over and over. Um, but for the first Earth Day, Walt Kelly drew this poster. Um, and Pogo was a great cartoon character in the 60s and 70s. Um, it had pretty good political overtones. Um, and he was in the Okefenokee Swamp. He's a possum. But our old friend Richard Nixon was the one that decided to establish an environmental protection agency. And uh, this is uh, swearing in Ruckelhaus, the first administrator. So, but back here in Butte in the 70s, um, the Anaconda Company actually hired their first environmental manager and his name was John Spindler and he wrote this paper and it's good because it explains wh what they were doing to change their operation to improve water quality in Silver Bow Creek. Um, but it also provides data, which I'll show later, so we can see what was water quality like in Silver Bow Creek at this time. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So we'll be looking at this again and again. So here's, here's basically the Butte operation. This is the Kelly mine, so that's where they were pumping mine water out of. It was coming down here, going through the Warm Springs ponds, and then discharging. The tailings ponds were also discharging. At that time, Silver Bow Creek was still looked at as part of the operation, more than a creek that we were going to restore. But John Spindler was a biologist, I believe, and his first job, he had a job working for the state of Montana. Um, as a biologist, a fisheries biologist. So let's talk about Superfund and what it really is. Um, it is this process, and, and uh, after working in Superfund for 30 years, I'm pretty convinced it's a really damn good, solid process. Um, any, any big process has its flaws, but... Um, <sighs> So pretty simple, you, you decide on these sites all over and Silver Bow Creek and um, Anaconda and uh, the Clark Fork were all listed. National priorities list means it becomes a Superfund site. Then you start in on investigations. 
Uh, then you do, once you figure out how wide, how deep, whether it's water, whether it's soil, whether it's dust, then you move into what are we going to do about it, and you call in engineers and actually toxicologists and whatever. Um, and eventually, this is an EPA process, they write a proposed plan. They say, this is where we're going with it. They put up this stop sign because it's, wait a minute, we're not going any further until we bring the public on board. So they write a proposed plan, they accept comments, um, and then they make their decision, record a decision. Um, in this case, 2006 was our record of decision. Um, Oh, we skipped one. Anyways, um, quit it. Should have checked on that. One of the things you have to do, so it says science and law. I've mentioned that before. One of the things EPA has to do is they go and they say, what applies here? And that's the applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements. And in the case of water quality, it was um, Montana's own standards, which is DEQ7. So um, that's what they have to live with unless they kind of decide they can't, unless they decide it's technically impractical, blah, technically impracticable to get there. But they, EPA still has to define it as being protective of human health and the environment. So right now, 2019, they're trying to amend the rod. There's a new proposed plan out. They plan on waving copper and zinc during storm events, and that's it. But they've sort of got this promise to ARCO that if they do a whole bunch of extra work, there may be additional waivers. But at some point, when you've got data that are reaching this asymptotic flat level, at some point you've got to say, no matter how much money or effort we throw at this, we're not going to make enough improvement. So. Silver Bow Creek was first named in 1983, but actually it was just Silver Bow Creek. And sometime along the way, and by 1987, they said, what about all of this back up here? So they, it's now Silver Bow Creek Butte area. Um, these are the operable units. Butte Priority Soils, which is what we're going to talk about largely. Streamside Tailings is the other one we're going to talk about. Um, there's Butte Mine Flooding. West Side Soils, which isn't even started yet. This one is Active Mine. That is deferred to DEQ to manage until the mine closes, and then they'll decide if it's a super fun site. And then there's the Warm Springs Ponds, which has a uh, interim record of decision, meaning they didn't really make a decision. Um, so the difference between Butte Priority Soils are this Butte area piece and Silver Bow Creek. In Butte, they have to manage stormwater, they have to capture and treat contaminated groundwater, and then they have to remove those streamside tailings and rebuild a creek and floodplain. When we're talking about streamside tailings, they got to remove the tailings and rebuild the stream and floodplain. They're not, they never intended to address groundwater because it would be pretty hard to address 25 miles of groundwater. There's no intent to uh, address stormwater, but it's not an urban area with all of these drainages coming down in it. And, and I'll show you in a minute why I think that one's pretty good. So let's go back to Butte Priority Soils. Um, of course, here's the Berkeley Pit. Here's the Yankee Doodle Tailings Impoundment. This is the current mine. Um, this is the old course of Silver Bow Creek. Of course, there's absolutely no creek there now. Then it comes down to this point here. This is being variously called Upper Silver Bow Creek or Metro Storm Drain. The only water in it that you will ever see is storm water. So it is a storm drain. And we have Blacktail Creek coming in here when it passes MSD, it magically becomes Silver Bow Creek. So let's talk about what's gone on here, what we've figured out. Um, but first of all, all across the nation, uh, large urban areas have had to address stormwater. 
Butes is just particularly bad because of the metals. Um, but you know, here's stormwater running off a dump. Um, so you have these dumps, you cap them and vegetate them, pretty much controls that runoff. Um, so here is, here are all those green areas are the caps. Here's the major storm drains. This is MSD, this is Buffalo Gulch, and this is Missoula Gulch. Missoula Gulch is the only one that has a very good management system on it. It's retention ponds, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so let's look at how does stormwater compare to normal flow conditions. And so in this graph, we're again looking at a compliance ratio. So my red line there is what we can see. Whether it's normal flow conditions or stormwater, the creek is nowhere near meeting standards. Well, this isn't too bad getting down in here. But look at stormwater for total recoverable copper. Well, like I said, they're looking at waving copper during storm events uh, for total recoverable copper and zinc. So let's look at that. Um, this is, um, again, the acute standard, the chronic standard. So if they waived it for normal flow conditions, which they haven't said they're doing, um, they would be meeting standards. These are, these are annual maximums because the way EPA looks at it is they can, they can miss meeting the standard one time every three years. So do the maximums. They're probably there for chronic if they waive it. Um, they're still not there for stormwater. They need to do a bunch of work, and that's a whole other big topic. But the one thing that's worked are these stormwater retention ponds. And so they fill up to a certain level, hold that water. The next storm raises it up. It starts to discharge down to that base level. Um, and, and it really treats the water. And how, how well? Well, if we measure copper going into this pond here, and then there's another pond, and we measure water coming out, and we put it in a box and whisker plot, it looks like that. Notice this is back to concentration, but this is a logarithmic scale. So here's, here's water coming into that pond, here's water coming out, um, and uh, this is Blacktail Creek upstream of the influence of any of those storm drains. So we've kind of taken the worst water and turned it into something that looks like upstream water. It's probably still not, it's not meeting standards, but it's very effective. So moving on, um, that was storm water. I also want to look at what about, what about um, the water that came out of the mines um, and groundwater in general. But um, so at one time, this is the confluence, Blacktail Creek, Silver Bow Creek. You can see how cloudy the water is. That's probably because it's precipitating iron like crazy. It's probably reddish color even. Um, these kids are fishing on Blacktail Creek. This is a fishing derby. And, and I always assume that the fish would come down here and go, whoop, I'm not going out there. And so they'd kind of congregate down here. But since they turned off the pumps in 1982, all of that water is going to fill up 10,000 miles of underground workings and the Berkeley pit. So it's all flooding. It's all rising. Um, the EPA decided it was technically impracticable to ever meet water quality standards in the groundwater there. But they said, we can control it by pumping it and treating it and make sure it meets water quality standards to protect Silver Bow Creek downstream. And they'll protect human health by not letting people swim in it. So um, here's a little graph. And this is, again, back to uh, concentrations and, again, on a logarithmic scale. Um, these, are, these are the measurements that Spindler made in Silver Bow Creek in the 70s. So we start out here. The upper one's a maximum, and the lower one's a, an average. So, um, we start out here with maximum values, 100,000 parts per billion. It's pretty, it's deadly anyways. But we, we can see he was bringing it down. Here's where we start on Superfund, and it's pretty close to the average back there, and we've been dropping it down since. So 
I'm talking about groundwater, it's not just the 10,000 miles of flooding underground and the mine system. Um, the Berkeley pit, in my mind, as a hydrogeologist, is now one really big well that's capturing all the 10,000 miles of underground working. So all the water in that underground system flows towards the pit. As long as they keep the pit at a certain level, it will never release water into Silver Bow Creek. And so then we've created, there's this divide that's been created by, by, that, by that well, or by 100 years of pumping, really. Um, and there's alluvial groundwater headed towards Silver Bow Creek. And of course, the most notorious tailings that affect water quality are the parrot tailings. There was one well that had copper levels at a million parts per billion. That's a whole other story. Um, but so that downstream portion, uh, that alluvial aquifer, um, EPA's written that off too. They've said that's technically impractical, practicable to ever fix, but we will manage it. We will make sure we manage it. So they, wrote, they drew this in brown, they drew this technical impracticability waiver area and then they said, well, we've got to capture and treat water. So here's one of the capture systems. This is an underground horizontal well called the subdrain. And here's one. It's called the hydraulic control channel. It's an open channel. And it captures groundwater. You'll notice there's a gap in the middle. The proposed plan is, has looked very hard at this. And it's going to require additional groundwater capture in that area. Um, so let's move on to cleaning up a creek um, itself. So this was the Colorado tailings. It looked this way when I first moved here in 1990. And uh, so this is the Colorado tailings, barren of any kind of vegetation, too much acid, too high of metals. Um, but you have Silver Bow Creek running right along it. Not only that, Silver Bow Creek, when they measure load of copper upstream and downstream of this, they realized that it's like 80% of the copper load was coming in through this reach. So they knew they had to capture groundwater as well. So first of all, you dig it all up. Uh, then you bring in clean soil and rebuild a creek. Um, and so here, here's a before and after. Um, Colorado tailings with the creek going around it. Uh, this is the butte reduction works up in here. Um, so this is what it looks like now, rebuilt floodplain and creek. This berm defines a boundary of a 100-year floodplain. Um, just because you'll want to keep this in mind, that's the sewage treatment plant right there. But here's the groundwater treatment plant for the alluvial aquifer. It's just lime addition. Works really well. Um, but I wanted to point out, again, sewage treatment plant, sewage treatment plant discharges right there. And that station we've been looking at, SS07, just is they're making measurements of copper right below that, which is a good thing. EPA in a 2008 report called the sewage treatment plant the largest single um, tributary source of copper to Silver Bow Creek. Um, so, um, I've already mentioned that. They're going to do additional groundwater and stormwater work. Now we're going to look downstream where they had to do the same thing. Remove the tailings and re rebuild a floodplain and creek. This is Ramsey Flats. You can see that the tailings were fairly thick. They range from, I don't know, two feet to eight feet or something. Um, this is what it looks like. It used to look like in the summer, those are copper salts that are being wicked to the surface. So when I mentioned stormwater, you can imagine how bad this would be if that um, gets soaked up and runs off into the creek. And, and on the Clark Fork, they documented these slicken areas uh, causing fish kills. They measured high levels of copper in the creek, and they found lots of dead fish. But once you remove everything um, and rebuild a creek, you no longer have a stormwater problem. So here they are rebuilding the Ramsey Flat area. Um, this is what it looks like. So you know it used to be pretty wide. This is the biggest single deposit of those tailings. 
from the 1908 flood. Um, but here they've rebuilt the floodplain and rebuilt the stream. They've actually had to go back in the last few years and clean up areas where they started to see salts appear at the surface again. So they would excavate more stuff. Um, so it's, they said they were finished in 2015 with the bulk of it, but they're, they're doing some finish up work. So now we're gonna look at some USGS data and kind of get an idea of how well this has been working overall. So we have this station SS01, that's on Blacktail Creek at Harrison Avenue. So really nothing, even if it's not meeting standards, we're not gonna rip up neighborhoods and um, try and do anything more up there. So we can look at that maybe as an uh, anthropogenic background. Um, SS07, which reflects the work we've done in Butte, and then SS17D, which is right above the Warm Springs Pond, and that reflects streamside tailings. So here we have um, my graph with compliance ratios again, um, and we can see um, there are two things happening here in 1997 that probably caused that spike. For one thing, it was a very high flow year, so you have a stream with more erosive uh, um, power, and it's picking up bed and, and bank sediments. Uh, but the other thing is, that's when they were rebuilding that Colorado tailings area, so they were releasing a lot of extra stuff during the excavation. Or, as I like to say, you gotta break a few eggs to make an omelet. Um, down here, again, once this has come down fairly far, uh, what was this spike? Well, that was 2011. Again, a really high flow year. So let's go look at that little tail end and see where we're at there. Um, this one's not so convincing that we're making progress anymore. It's just mostly noise and no real trend. So this one is not the trend line. That's whether it's meeting standard or not. Um, but one thing I'd point out, in, in uh, 2016, uh, our sewage treatment plant uh, was upgraded. It was finished in 2016. And like I said, it was once called the largest tributary source of copper. So I'd like, to, like you to notice the distance between, here's SS01, which is at Harrison Avenue, and then SS07, which is where Silver Bowl Creek. So look at the gap there. After 2016, look at how we've closed the gap. So when they rebuilt the sewage treatment plant, it was being rebuilt for nutrients. But they thought that it would probably help with metals, and it appears that it has. I think it's now meeting their, their um, they are regulated under DEQ, not under Superfund. Um, and, God, what did I write? Oh, that's what I put there. That's the sewage treatment plants finished. So here's the real story about the sewage treatment plant. When they were discharging, they discharged huge amounts of ammonia. And what happens with ammonia is it nitrifies, and so it's sucking up oxygen. It's using the oxygen in the creek for this chemical reaction to turn it to nitrate or nitrite. Um, and Dr. Gammons had found that this area down there at night, in the summer, oxygen levels drop to below one milligram per liter. Um, they say trout are starting to suffer at about five or six. So he named it the dead zone. Um, so here's how they've done on their nutrients. Um, and uh, that mostly they've taken almost all of the ammonia out. That's the total nitrogen they've taken out. But from 626 uh, pounds per day down to 74 pounds per day, um, you know, we're talking orders of magnitude, 56 down to two for phosphorus. So it's been really effective. Um, but now let's look at um, what, what does Warm Springs Pond still do in this whole equation? So this is Silver Bow Creek uh, that we looked at before at Opportunity. And then this is the Warm Springs Ponds. So they're still taking out, they're still protecting the Clark Fork. So like I said, it's an interim record of decision for the Warm Springs Ponds. 
the real decision is out there somewhere in the future, um, they've got to consider <laughs> if they want to, just for this reason, they've got to consider whether they want to keep it. A lot of people would like to see through flow. One of the things about the ponds is it probably warms the water, which is becoming a very large issue for both Silver Bow and the Clark Fork in the summer. Um, but now let's look at a biomonitor. Um, and I like this one because I had a student here at Tech, um, Garrett Carnath worked with me on this and we worked with a woman, uh, Michelle Hornberger from the USGS. She's done these studies for a long time. This is a hydropsyche caddis and we're going to look at how much copper is taken up in the body of a caddis. Now, the, the reason you want hydropsyche or the reason they're really good is a number of reasons. One is they stay in one place, they're sessile, so they represent water quality that passes by one spot. Um, the other thing is they're a net spinning uh, caddis, so they're collecting whatever's flowing by and eating it. So they're taking it all in. Um, and the third one is they're uh, very tolerant of copper. So it takes a lot of copper before these guys completely disappear. So they're around and you can see trends with them. Um, so now we're going to look at a site that's all the way up at Blacktail Creek. Um, and this is where you get up into the mountains. So it's a creek about that wide and that deep. And I, I would say it's about as pristine as we're going to get. And we're going to look at SS07 and SS17D again. So this is a combination of both Garrett Mai's data and Michelle Hornberger's data. So the only site that USGS did on Silverbow Creek was that site at Opportunity. Otherwise, all their sites were on the Clark Fork. And I, I kept, for the longest time, I kept talking to Michelle and saying, couldn't we get money to look at Silverbow Creek too? It'd be pretty damn interesting. But anyways, we finally got her to at least run samples for us. So it starts back up here. So these are in um, parts per million copper and so up here we're at 800. We can see this similar downward trend. There's these weird spikes. This is actually a low flow year. I don't know what that means. So, um, But here's where we started adding our data in. So is what Michelle wanted was she said, I would love to have you do this. You can pick whatever sites you want. It's what I would like to know is, is there a seasonal variation? So would you collect? And so we were collecting in fall, winter, spring, and summer. Um, and so that's why it goes year by year until you get down here. So um, here's an opportunity, or the gray, um, at SS07. So it's the trend you would expect, way upstream. But um, here's just uh, Garrett's data. Um, and we can see, and so this has got a few more, these are all the stations we did. Um, 17D, 7, and then all the way up to Blacktail. So again, you might ask, uh, what does a little less than 200 mean? Um, and fortunately, there was, a, um, there was somebody that worked with Michelle Hornberger at the USGS, his name's Dan Kane. And he put together both Michelle Hornberger's data on hydropsyche body burden, but he also took Dan McGuire's data, who was looking at diversity. Overall, what was the, he has biological indices. So he looks at everything he can capture, the diversity of the different groups, whether they're caddis or mayfly. And um, so he took that data and combined it with the body burden data. And he came up with these pretty interesting results. This paper was called Calibrating Biomonitors. And this was done on Silver Bow Creek, I mean, on, Bla on Clark Fork. So here, here, we're, here we're perking along, starting at 1,000 and going down to above 200. But you can see with all of these indices, whether it's um, the number of individuals of uh, heptagenated mayflies, or whether it's the number of mayfly species, or whether it is the number of uh, macroinvertebrate species altogether, we can see this bump up. 
and it seems to occur right about 200. So I don't know if that's applicable everywhere, but I think things as we're coming to that asymptotic level, it's time to start looking at biological monitors and trying to figure out the rest of the story. So, um, of course, at the top of the food chain, and is what most people are really interested in, um, except for um, people that are really interested in bugs, are how are the fish doing? So, um, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks started making measurements um, and counting fish in the stream in 2002. And is what they found was there were no fish in Silverbow Creek. There were in the tributaries. So we had brook trout in Browns Gulch. We had uh, cutthroat and brook trout in German Gulch. Those are the main two tributaries. And then up in Blacktail Creek, they have uh, brook trout. And then actually way back up where in, in the mountains on Blacktail Creek, there are still cutthroat, and there were cutthroat. So this is through time. Here we are starting back at 2003, and this is at that Ramsey site. So Ramsey was still a mess when they started this. There were definitely no fish there. Um, starting in 2007, they started to see some brook trout. But you can see brook trout, well, here they spiked up, but stay kind of level. But this is cutthroat, the red, red or cutthroat. So um, it's improved. Um, this is, an, is what Jason Lindstrom with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks would say, is this isn't number of fish for capture in first pass. This isn't real solid data. It's kind of an indicator, but is what they would like to see. And I think their passes are about 1,000 feet long. Trying to remember if they go in meters or feet, but they like to see about 600 fish per mile. That's a good fish number. This comes nowhere close to that. So it's still, for some reason, stress out. Back here in 2016, they started doing, these were all fall, they started doing summer. So usually you look summer, fall, summer, fall, summer, fall. Something's going on in the summer, and they're probably seeking refuge in German Gulch and Browns Gulch during the summer. And so the next question really, well, this was, this was a good day because I was out there helping the FWP biologists. This was at the Colorado tailings area, and this was the first trout. This was a brook trout, so this was coming down from Blacktail. This wasn't coming up from German Gulch. But that was a day to finish up work and go have a beer, for sure. Um, so what we're left with now is these are the likely stressors now. Um, probably need to put stop having all of our emphasis on its metals and start looking at, is it still nutrients? Is it still temperature? Is it the habitat? When you rebuild 25 miles of river, do you really think you got it right, and I doubt it. I mean, with the best effort, it's still an engineered uh, stream, and engineers just don't do the same job that Mother Nature did. Um, but water quality, uh, water column metals, and possibly the sediments are still there, and actually stormwater's still a big question. Um, I never finish a talk without giving uh, kudos to the Clark Fork Watershed Education Program. Um, they take our understanding of both Silverbow Creek and the Clark Fork to all of the schools along the Clark Fork from Butte all the way to Missoula. And um, uh, of course, you know, we have a lot of students in here. It's like this all needs to be passed on and we don't have the answers yet. We're still working on the answers, and we've actually just gotten to the really hard part now. Um, so are there any questions or comments? <laughs> Dang it.
Yeah. When you were showing those ratios, um, were you using the Montana standard ratio or the Idaho standard ratio? Or were you using the federal standard as one? Numerically, they're the same. It's just a matter of whether you've got whether you're measuring total recoverable or just the dissolved fraction. And maybe I should explain that. Total recoverable includes both dissolved and suspended particles with, say, copper on it. And then dissolved is a filtered sample. It's not truly dissolved, actually. It's still some kind of it's a lot smaller stuff. What is the source of uh, beach drinking water? <laughs> We have three sources. One of them is the Big Hole River. So we go all the way to the other side of the Continental Divide for that water. It's a long ways off. It's got a filtration plant that was built in the early 2000s, I think, which is at Feely. We have one at Molten Reservoir, which is up, up above Yankee Doodle Tailings. But again, that's clean water. There's also a filtration plant on the road up to Molten. <coughs> And then our new one was uh, paid for by the Natural Resource Damage Program is at Basin Creek. And that's state of the art um, filtration. Um, and we actually, right now, with that new plant, $30 million plant, we probably have the best water in the state of Montana for just turning on your tap and drinking it. No, it goes up to Bell Creek. And actually, it, and when he says Bell Creek, that's Blacktail Creek. There used to be a smelter all the way up at Harrison Avenue called the Bell Smelter. And I guess, I didn't grow up here, but people who grew up here called it. Right. And uh, as a matter of fact, up there at Father Sheehan Park, they have those, it's the high, they say those numbers are what they would like to see on all Montana streams. It's all brick trout, but they, they just they get a ton of fish up there. So if you want to go fishing in Butte, go to Father Sheehan Park. <laughs> oh. Go ahead. I hope this isn't too low of a question. It's a hazardous to live in Butte. I'm busy. <laughs> I'm just a dumb hydrogeologist. <laughs> no, I, so I'll give you my opinion. Yeah, it's, it's really safe to live here, right? They've, they've done a lot. The programs we have in place have uh, made immense changes. You would find people that would argue with me some, but um, I don't know. I, I think it's, it's good. I like to put it in this perspective. Um, if you were going to have a choice between living in Butte or San Francisco and you didn't have to worry about the cost, um, what would you choose? And I would say in Butte, yeah, maybe there's additional risk from the metals. I don't think so personally. But if you live in San Francisco, the question is when's the big one happening? And it's not if, it's when. And so uh, your risk is huge. But it's a pretty popular city. In your opinion, which uh, uh, measures had the biggest impact on uh, you know, improving the water quality? Because you talked about the caps, you talked about the capture systems, and probably all of it. But if there was one thing which were had the biggest um, impact. So far, two things for stormwater. You're saying then. Two, two things um, really was getting the Colorado tailings and the bulk of the Butte reduction works out of the middle of the creek was a good thing. Um, and then all the capping on the hill, all the waste dumps, because there were a lot of waste dumps, just bare waste dumps. Do you think just doing more caps? Because there's a lot out there still. You know, it'll be interesting to see, because they've said there's supposedly more capping in the proposed plan. And it'll be interesting to see where that is. I mean, I know some dumps I want to still see capped. Or building more retention. I think building the retention ponds is going to be the biggest answer now. Oh, she, yeah. Um, Jeanette. Some of Oak Creek, I know you obviously talked a lot about surface water, but, and I haven't been following things, but on the ground, 
groundwater and things. Like I know that they, before they started cleaning up, they for that RIFS they had some water quality on monitoring wells. And how is that looking? Like, Are you t you're talking about in Butte? Well, no, I'm talking along Street Side. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, like, um, has the have they seen changes in the groundwater quality? I don't know. They do a few wells, but I, I really think. Um, so one of the things that um, what, one of the things in this monitor. So I just showed you USGS data, but um, in Butte, Arco collects way more data, and at these same stations, and downstream and streamside, um, DEQ collects a lot of data. Um, in Butte, ARCO collects data almost monthly at five stations. Um, so you have, it's, it, I will guarantee it's the most robust data set in the state of Montana. Um, and downstream DEQ collects it quarterly at about, boy, eight or nine stations, I bet. And they've done it for quite a while now. And I, I have gotten the data from DEQ, I've never played with it. but. I mean, there's a, there's a playground of data out there for anybody who wants to get it and start trying to figure things out. Um, but I, I went back to this because I think this still big gap between SS07 and Streamside, I think that largely reflects residual groundwater. I mean, you know, there's got to be residual groundwater. This is, and in the record of decision and the consent decree, they, they just recognized it's going to have, we'll have to wait and let it flush out over time. John? So is the groundwater that's being treated down by the wastewater treatment plant, is that just coming from the, the French drain or, or, the, or is there another place where groundwater is extracted? It, it's coming from two places. One was, and let's see how far I have to go back. Um, oh, it's going the wrong way. How'd the beaver get in there? Oh, there we go. So there's that subdrain, um, and then there's this thing called the hydraulic control channel, and it's just an open channel. So when they were doing analysis before they removed the Colorado tailings, they had done loading analysis, and they realized that load in, load in here um, was far, far lower than load out and it was groundwater coming in. When you account for any other groundwater or any other sources, it was clear that it was a groundwater problem. So in part, like right here, because the stream was picking up so much um, groundwater, they left the stream in place, uh, just as an open channel. But when they rebuilt the floodplain in the stream, they elevated it so that it became a losing reach instead of a gaining reach. So that was, that was pretty interesting engineering design, I thought. Uh, I noticed that you did not include on your maps uh, the rocker out the beginning. No, I didn't. And, and I'm curious about uh, whether there remains any person to influence on the on the I don't. You know, I don't know. Again, it would be interesting to go back and look. I would say it by far pales to the arsenic that comes out of the Warm Springs ponds in the middle of the summer. So the ponds store arsenic all winter, and then in the summer it starts releasing it. Um, and interestingly enough about arsenic, we really don't have an arsenic problem in Silver Bow Creek. So the harder one to meet there, the aquatic life standard is not a hardness-based standard, and it's simply the chronic standard is 150. And um, the human health standard is 10. So it's what they go by is 10. You gotta meet 10 in the stream. We hardly ever exceed it in Silver Bow Creek, and only during very high flow years, and we're already exceeding it all the way back up at SS01 at Harrison Avenue. So there's not much you're going to do about it. There's really no input as it passes through um, Butte Priority Soils for arsenic. 
Ev, so, sorry. Wounds <laughs> brings plants. You said people have talked about wanting to take those out and just letting it be free flowing. That would have the advantage of keeping the water a little cooler. But there must be a whole lot of sediments that aren't very friendly that have accumulated there, which is why the creek and the cotton fork are cleaner downstream at yeah. this time of the year. So what would a transition <laughs> well, I, there's a lot of questions to weigh about the ponds, I think. Um, uh, for one, the berms are considered a high hazard dam. And Atlantic Richfield has just shown that they have very little tolerance for risk. So everybody thinks they'll want to keep the ponds, and they may, but not necessarily so. But you're right. If they were, you know, if we think we're like Milltown and we want to remove the dam, there's a lot, there's a lot to deal with, and we'd have to deal with those sediments and take them somewhere. Um, and so, I, I, well, I guess they could just haul them across the road to the Opportunity tailings ponds. But um, there's just, um, you know, there's a, an amazing bird population that uses that now. I mean, it, it's got a lot of advantages. Um, so it's, it's, there's going to be a lot to consider, I think. And, and, you know, they'll probably wait and see how we're doing on Silver Bow Creek over the next 10 years before they really figure out what they're doing down there. I interestingly enough, EPA waived total recoverable copper on the Clark Fork back in, I believe, the 90s. So it's already waved down there. Um, and their, their metals levels are lo way lower than Silver Bow, really. So let's. Thanks. Thanks.